All right. It is half past three, so I suggest we get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our SPT seminar series, where we aim to question the relation between the technological and the planetary. To sum it up, my name is Jochem Zwier, and I work at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And I have been organizing this seminar series for the Society for Philosophy of Technology, SPT, since last year, together with my colleague Vincent Bloch, uh, who unfortunately unfortunately uh, cannot make it today uh, because he is ill. So oh. we of course wish him all the best. Uh, he would have really liked to be here, but uh, there's only so much a body can do, um, apparently. As Spinoza kind of said at some point, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, I hope you all had a good summer. Uh, just before the summer break, we had an interesting talk by Susanna Lindberg from Leiden University and are now very happy to continue into 2023 and 2024. Just as a reminder, I'm recording this session. So if you do not uh, want your face to be on the recording, please just switch off your camera. And also recordings of previous sessions can be found on the YouTube page of Vincent Block. If you cannot find it, uh, please just send me a mail and I can forward uh, the address to you. Um, today's session will then also be uploaded there in a couple of days. It usually takes some time for teams to, uh, to finalize the recording, but I'll upload it when I can. So for today, I am very happy to welcome Graham Harmon to our seminar series. I'm sure that he hardly needs an, any introduction at all, to be honest, since he has been one of the leading voices in what has come to be known as speculative realism and object-oriented ontology, has written many works about the metaphysics of objects, all the while extensively engaging with the work of Heidegger, with the work of Latour, uh, and many others. For today's seminar, Graham will speak about technology as a mode of existence. It sounds really suitable, I would say, for our seminar series. He will talk for about 45 minutes, uh, after which there will be plenty of time for discussion until uh, 5 p.m. going by my time zone here, uh, which will be 8 in the morning for uh, Graham, who is joining us from the U.S. Uh, my colleague from Wageningen University, Clemens Driessen, let me see if he actually is already here. I don't see him yet, but I'm sure he will join soon. Uh, but he has agreed to start the discussion, uh, after which the floor will be open for everyone. So as always, uh, this is the, the kind of method we like to use in this series. Please write your questions as succinctly as you can uh, in the chat. Uh, this is usually more efficient when it comes to posing the questions as well as moderating the discussion. Uh, if that is all clear, I would now like to give the floor to Graham Harmon. Uh, Graham, many thanks for joining us again, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joachim, and it's great to be here at 6.30 in the morning in the Los Angeles area. And you're all looking at my refrigerator, although I'm looking out at the Pacific Ocean, which you can't see. So there's quite a contrast in views between audience and speaker in this case. Um, Technology as a mode of existence. There are two people who come to mind probably, and that's how I intended it. One of them, of course, being Simondon, the title of his important book being on the mode of existence of technical objects. The other being Bruno Latour, whose uh, late masterwork in 2012-13 is called An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, and technology is one of the modes. So uh, looking at some of the similarities and differences between uh, Latour and Simondon on technology will help uh, us go in several different directions today. But I wanted to start with Heidegger, because Heidegger was the topic of my first book. And of course, Heidegger is a philosopher of technology, also a philosopher of the tool analysis. And my first book was about that tool analysis. And so I want to make some distinctions here. Of course, the famous uh, passage in Being in Time about the tool analysis is the notion that, against what Husserl said, things do not appear to us primarily Phenomenally, they appear to us primarily as invisible, as taken for granted, as being in use, and that tools tend to become uh, visible or obtrusive to us when something goes wrong. Famous Heideggerian idea. And uh, 
For Heidegger, they withdraw into a kind of holistic system. He says, taken strictly, there is no such thing as an equipment. All the equipment refers to all the other pieces of equipment, and they're ultimately all linked into my own Dasein and its potentiality for being. So uh, there's a withdrawal for Heidegger. Tools tend to hide, unlike present at hand entities that we perceive or think about. Tools in use tend to hide. And they also, there's a monism there. Tools withdraw into a system for Heidegger. Now, it's interesting that sometimes uh, a fairly straightforward relation is assumed between the tool analysis and Heidegger's later writings on technology. But I would point out a couple of things. The first is that the tool analysis and being in time doesn't just hold good for tools. Any entity will tend to withdraw into a background while we're taking it for granted, such as the oxygen that I'm breathing right now and wasn't thinking about until I mentioned it. And you wouldn't probably call the oxygen a tool in the narrow sense. And yet, it, it fits the specifications of Heidegger's tool analysis in the sense that it withdraws and it seems to be linked to all the other equipment on which I'm relying. Technology, however, is the opposite for Heidegger. Technology is that which reduces things to their calculability, their visibility, bestand uh, gestell. And so in a sense, uh, technology extends the present at hand and being in time, not the ready to hand. And so technology goes off in a different direction. And uh, as is well known, Heidegger is not especially a lover of technology. You can see this in his politics when he talks about how uh, uh, the Americans and the Soviet Union are metaphysically equivalent, since both are simply concerned with using technology to manipulate the standing reserve of beings for different reasons. And then Simondon gets his revenge by saying there are three civilizations, three three societies that have done this, and he adds Nazi Germany. So he he pokes Heidegger in the eye there, perhaps, by saying Nazi Germany also manipulates technology to reduce beings to their presence. In any case, um, the point I wanted to make here is that Heidegger's being is not just withdrawn. It's not just something that hides from us and that tends to be forgotten, but it also tends toward oneness. Uh, when Heidegger talks about beings in the plural, he's not just talking about things that are visible. He's also talking about their plurality as opposed to being. Being itself is always spoken of as a unity for Heidegger, just as Earth is when he talks about the fourfold later. So there's this kind of monism there in Heidegger that we will also find in, in Simon Dom. And I've also written in this uh, connection about uh, two other thinkers of the 20th century who resemble Heidegger in this respect. And those are Clement Greenberg, the art critic, and Marshall McLuhan, who's going to play a role in today's paper. Uh, Clement Greenberg is worth mentioning briefly. Uh, he's probably not quite as well known in Europe as in the United States. In the United States, he was the godfather of New York's moment taking over the world art scene in 1948, uh, following the Second World War. Uh, Greenberg was the, the spokesperson in many ways for Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, the Dutch-born American artist uh, who became uh, great pioneers of what's called abstract expressionism. And uh, Greenberg's idea about modern art is that content of art is not important. Content is really no more than what he calls literary anecdotes, which is why he was not an admirer of Dali or any other artists where there's too much going on in the content. For Greenberg, what characterizes modern painting is again, this background, like we find with Heideggerian being. This idea that painting is really an art done on a flat surface, even though since the Italian Renaissance, painters have been trying to create this three-dimensional illusion that's not what painting should be doing. Painting should be well aware of its flatness. And this is why he favored abstract painting. This is why he thought analytic cubism was the greatest art movement of the 20th century and so forth. It's because Greenberg, like Heidegger, is uh, very committed to the flatness and unity of the background so that all surface content becomes trivial, just as for Heidegger, all beings become somewhat trivial. McLuhan's somewhat different but because McLuhan doesn't believe in a single background, but McLuhan, of course, believes the medium is the message. He says the, the content of any medium is like the stenciling on the atomic bomb. Uh, to argue about the good or bad content of a television show misses the point. The point is the difference between television as a medium and radio as a medium. The deep properties of the medium are what matters. The content is somehow distracting and, and trivial. Uh, and so that's, that's a an important current in 20th century thought that cuts across several different fields. And uh, uh, 
I just wanted to put that on the table first, because the relation between figure and ground, of course, is also very important for Simondon's conception of technology. But I want to start with Latour and what, what was going on with Latour's book, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence. Um, presumably, there's some familiarity with, with Latour in this audience, at least with actor network theory. Of course, actor network theory goes way back to the late 1970s. Latour and others developed this uh, method. And what you do, of course, is you follow the actors. You don't assume in advance any distinction between subject and object. You don't assume any uh, hierarchization of which actors are important, which actors are unimportant. Famously, Latour looked at the wastebasket in a scientific laboratory as an important actor um, that explains how certain ideas are discarded. And so uh, this, this leads to what is often called a flat ontology. Everything acts and a thing is only its actions, according to Latour's actor network theory. Now, the interesting thing about Latour, we talk a lot about philosophers having early and late periods, whether it's you know, Heidegger or, or Wittgenstein or you know, Schelling is sometimes said to have four periods. Latour is maybe the only philosopher I can think of who had his early and late periods almost simultaneously. He just wasn't publishing his late period. He began work on his modes of existence project in 1987 way back when, when uh, actor network theory was still just getting rolling. And as he explains in the modes book, the idea behind that, the, the uh, inquiry into modes of existence is that actor network theory is a powerful method, but it can also, everything in ANT starts sounding the same after a while. You, know, you use the ANT method, you look at any situation, you're looking for different heterogeneous actors that are both human and non-human and how they link to each other, how they take us on detours. And Latour's worry is that this just ends up making everything sound the same. It isn't as able to account for distinct zones of reality as uh, he would wish. And so he began working on this in 1987. When I first got to know him, I think in 1999, I was visiting his office in Paris and this was all very hush hush, don't tell anybody about this, but I have this secret project and he had a box with all these notes and CD-ROMs in it. And then it was revealed to a wider audience in 2007 at his 60th birthday celebration in Cerisy de Salle in Normandy. And then it was finally published in 2012 in modified form after he listened to everyone's critiques. Now, what is a mode? A mode is a zone of reality that is somehow cut off from other zones of reality. And there are some precedents for this. Uh, in Spinoza, there's the precedent not so much of the mode as of the attributes. Right? In, Sp in Spinoza, the modes are the individual things. The attributes, however, are things like thought, extension, and then an infinite number of other uh, attributes that we are too pathetically unintelligent compared to God to ever grasp. But there's this vast sense, this infinity of, of attributes in Spinoza, which we only know two. That's one example. Another good example will be Lacan's registers, when he talks about the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real in the sense that um, the same object can be viewed in any any of those three registers. Uh, and both the analyst and the patient can mistake those registers. And this is something he added that wasn't really there in Freud. And he started with the imaginary, added the symbolic, and then later the real became more important for Lacan. So consider an example like castration, typical important psychoanalytic concepts. Um, there is, real castration, which doesn't really happen very often in, in human life, uh, except that it, it becomes real in the form of a symptom. Someone with castration anxiety can form a symptom. There's, of course, symbolic castration in the form of being publicly humiliated, and then there's imaginary castration. So the topic, the concept means three different things in those three different registers. And similarly for Latour, uh, the same one and the same thing can appear in any of the 15, actually 14 different modes and have a different significance in each of them. And it differs from Luhmann, for example, because if you read Luhmann's books, Nicholas Luhmann, the German sociologist, you will find that he tends to identify zones of reality with specific professions. So there's an art system, a political system, an economic system. Whereas for Latour, uh, the modes are more like different radio station, different radio frequencies all in the same airspace so that you can switch between different radio stations and all those radio frequencies are going through us, but we're only listening to one at a time. So uh, if you're familiar at all with Latour's books, he has 15 different modes of existence. One of them is not really a mode, uh, and that is what he calls double click. We can forget about that. And so then what you really have is you have two modes. 
One of them is network, the one we know from actor network theory, where all the modes are, oh, sorry, all the actors are interconnected in heterogeneous ways. And then he has the new mode called preposition. Not a very nice name, but that has to do with how the network split up into 14 different modes. And they are, Latour is, was very adamant that he wanted to think of these as historically contingent, as valid only for Western modern society. He even openly invites people from other civilizations to try to elaborate their own modes. Despite that, they look a lot like Kant's table of categories. There are four groups of three, and that's something he never really uh, adequately accounted for. Uh, he, but he did want to avoid any ontological interpretation of how the categories were grouped. I gave a, a paper on trying uh, trying to do that at Ceresi in 2007, and he reacted with horror. He said, no, no, these are supposed to be contingent, but then they're grouped uh, with such perfect mathematicity that uh, it's hard to believe they're truly contingent. He also gives no historical dates for when any of these modes emerged, which uh, for a thinker as empirically minded as Latour, that's somewhat surprising. He uh, calls the uh, project also an anthropology of the moderns. And you know that for the tour philosophy and is a kind of anthropology. He simply wanted to do an anthropology of scientists, not simply of supposedly primitive tribes. So how do these modes work? Well, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because that's not my central topic, but uh, you, you could read in a way the modes of existence project as a polemic against the dominance of two major modern discourses, science and economics. Science, in a sense, in the traditional sense of the capital S, modern science, um, has claimed a monopoly on truth, that a scientific approach to anything is supposed to be the right way to know it to its foundations. And for, to call something unscientific is tantamount to calling it worthless in many circles. And of course, that's where tried to change our sense of what science is. But he has that very helpful triad of three modes of existence that do not work in the same way of science, namely politics, law, and religion. These are his three examples of modes of existence that do not have the same conditions of, of veridiction, the same conditions of truth in, as science. And I'll start with law briefly, because law is the one that Latour probably rightly thought would be the most convincing to people. We are all aware in some sense that law does not function the same way as science when it comes to truth. Uh, a legal trial is not primarily a fact-finding mission to find out the truth of what really happened. That plays a role in it. But there are certain pieces of evidence that are excluded, right? For example, if a piece of evidence was obtained illegally by the police, even if it's true factual evidence, that cannot play a role in the trial. If a piece of factual evidence was not submitted by the required deadline, that cannot be considered as a truth. Um, if, if one side in a legal trial doesn't dispute something, then it is taken as true, even if it's not true. The lawyer simply didn't dispute it, and so the judge will or the jury can simply assume that it's true. And so law is not something we would ever confuse with science. We, we, don't, we would never simply replace a legal trial with the analysis done by DNA experts. DNA plays a more increasingly powerful role in legal trials, but it is subject to legal constraints. And so law is a very obvious example of a mode of, of truth with its own, sorry, with its own conditions of truth that are different from those of science. So that's probably the most convincing he admits. The second one, which is a little more contentious, is politics. There are people who do think politics should be rationalized, of course, that um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the new host of Cosmos, said on Twitter a few years ago, he wants to propose the foundation of a new country called Rationalia, I believe, where all political decisions will be made by the weight of the evidence. The implication seems to be that most political decisions are made for petty, corrupt reasons of self-interest, and if people would just get beyond that and look at scientific facts, then uh, our political problems would tend to, to vanish. Well, I think uh, by now, we would tend, many of us would tend to think of that as a naive vision of how politics works. Uh, I lived in Egypt for many years, as some of you know. For, I was teaching there for 16 years. And the fascinating ongoing and perhaps future political conflict in which Egypt will be involved is not its past conflicts with Israel, but more likely its future conflicts with countries such as Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan over Nile water rights. And if you start looking into the history of the Nile water rights, you can't really say who is supported by the weight of the evidence. Um, you know, Egypt's case has always been, hey, we all signed a treaty. 
And that treaty gives Egypt a very high percentage of Nile water rights as opposed to the other countries. But then the other countries in sub-Saharan Africa will say, yes, but that was under British colonialism. We didn't really have a choice to sign that or not. So that, that treaty is null and void. And then Egypt responds, yes, but we're 98% deserts. You have rain, we don't. And we have the biggest population. We, we deserve the Nile water. And then the, the sub-Saharan countries will respond, yes, but you're very inefficient. Your irrigation practices waste a lot of water. And then Egypt will respond, um, yes, but you're not very efficient either. And so it goes back and forth like this. And in the end, you can't really decide whose position is the most rational. And so in the end, there are threats to settle this by force eventually. It will simply become a matter of national survival and national interest. And there, this is why wars happen. There, we come to moments where what seems rational to one side doesn't seem rational to the other. And I'm not saying all conflicts are like that. There are conflicts in the world where it might seem fairly obvious to more, to more people who is in the right. Uh, but there are also conflicts where that's not entirely clear. Um, so politics, again, is a kind of uh, a mode of existence that does not have the same conditions of truth as science. And the final one, the more controversial one, is religion. Uh, Latour, being a practicing Catholic, unlike uh, many philosophers of our time, uh, where a certain agnosticism or atheism seems to be the most common uh, attitude in Western countries, and Latour's uh, religious attitude is strange because we would think of a religious belief as consisting in the idea that there is a God that objectively exists outside of our minds. But for Latour, that has to do with the scientific mode of truth, the objective existence of something outside of our minds. So Latour doesn't seem to view religion that way. He seems to view religion as identical with all the various processions and rituals through which it is acted out. So um, his Catholicism is extremely unorthodox, to say the least. It's, it's not your Thomist Catholicism. So in any case, um, I just wanted to say one other thing about the, the modes. There's another set of three modes, attachment, organization, and morality, that has to do with the decomposition of economics. Latour was very critical of economics as far back as his book, The Politics of Nature, in 1999. The way that economics tries to make itself the master of the social sciences the queen of the social sciences, I should say, that everything can be viewed in economic terms. Latour doesn't believe that because he thinks if you look closely at economics, it decomposes into these three other modes that are covered up by this idea that economics uh, is the common root of them all. In any case, what we find in Heidegger and in Simonson that we don't find in, in Heidegger, uh, we find it in Latour and Simondon, not in Heidegger, is that Latour is a lover of technology. And you might remember that the subtitle of his fun book, Aramis, is Or Love of Technology. And for those not familiar with the book, Latour was commissioned by the French government to do a study of why the Aramis, proposed Aramis transportation system for Paris failed. It was ultimately canceled by Jacques Chirac in 1987. And Aramis uh, was basically going to be a way of uh, using the French subway where instead of the large subway trains, there would be individual cars fitting a few people. You would get into one of the subway cars and you would press a button for which station you want to go to, and you would never have to change trains. The small car would do all the track changes for you. So you could get on in any part of Paris and get off in any other part of Paris. And uh, Latour went around and interviewed various people. They're all pointing the fingers at each other for why the project failed. But Latour's ultimate lesson is the failure of Aramis came from trying to innovate in too many areas at once. The innovation is something that needs to go hand in hand with a certain amount of banality. An event needs to be grounded in a situation in Baudouillian terms. Um, Marshall McLuhan tells the funny story that when he first sent Understanding Media to the publisher, his editor uh, half jokingly said, uh, this book is 90% new and that's the problem. A successful book should only be 10% new. And I think McLuhan was proud of the idea that his book was 90% new, but the real lesson might be that it's not a good thing to have a book that's 90% new. Uh, the human mind can only take a certain amount of novelty at once. And one final precursor of that is in Aristotle's Poetics when he's talking about metaphor. He says that uh, you can't have a statement that's all metaphors. Metaphor can be used to make prose more interesting but it should be done uh, intermittently. If you have a uh, use language in a way that's all metaphorical, he says it turns into a, a riddle. And he gives the very funny example of, I saw a man glue bronze on a man with fire, which you know it's impossible to know what that means. It turns out what it means is the ancient Greek medical practice 
of cauterizing a wound by putting hot metal on it. I saw a man glue bronze on a man with fire, but there's no clue there as to what it refers to because everything is metaphorical. Um, anyway, Latour is a lover of technology and he also marvels at the fact, as he puts it, that for every thousand books on scientific knowledge, there aren't 10 on technology. And uh, all modes for Latour are leaps. They represent a discontinuity. There's not a gradual shift, say, from law to politics. The same can exist in, in, two, in the same place at once, but when you're switching from law to politics or politics to scientific reference, there's always a kind of jump. And uh, Simondon says that as well. Simondon says technology is made up of sudden leaps. But the other thing that Latour admires in Simondon's theory of technology is the way he integrates it with magic, science, and philosophy, as well as aesthetics. He also admires that Simondon wants to view technology in terms of trajectories. I'll we'll get that in a minute when we switch to Simondon. The idea that a technology never just exists here and now, but it's a trajectory across time. In a way, that, that's too cheap and easy an insight to agree with too quickly because everyone loves change and dynamism these days. Everyone's against stasis. Everyone's against things remaining the same. It's associated with political oppression. It's associated with the lack of novelty. And yet I want to uh, emphasize and double down on the idea that you need a certain amount of banality for real change to be possible. In philosophers such as Bergson and Deleuze, there's almost too much novelty. There's so much novelty that you can't really find anything that's not novel. And this is an implicit critique that Badiou makes of them in his theory of events, that you need to have situations so that events are meaningful. They're punctuated. They happen only once in a while. They're not gradual. Um, I just wanted to point out that Latour, although he uses the word trajectory a lot, is not a philosopher of trajectories. He is a philosopher of the here and now. There's a tendency these days to mix uh, Deleuze with Whitehead's. Uh, Isabel Stengers, who many people consider her book on Whitehead to be the best, the book to beat, as some Whitehead scholars call it. I think nonetheless, she has too much of a tendency to see commonalities between Heidegger and, uh, sorry, Deleuze and Whitehead. And I think the difference between the Whitehead Latour camp on one side and the, and the Deleuze Bergson camp on the other is that uh, becoming, of course, is fundamental uh, for Bergson and Deleuze. It is not fundamental for, for Whitehead and Latour for whom perishing is fundamental. Things exist only for the flash of an instant. They are replaced with very similar, but not quite the same things in the next instance. And this is why one of Latour's modes is called uh, reproduction. Because he, Latour once agreed when I said, you're really the anti-Bergsonian, aren't you? And he said, yes, in the sense that things do not automatically continue in existence from one instant to the next for Latour. They have to keep recreating themselves like an occasionalist philosophy, of which Whitehead is also a, a fine example. So I, I know I'm in the minority here, but I see a very strict dividing line between the Whiteheadian tradition and the Deleuzean tradition, and I see Latour on the on the Whitehead side. Um, in in the modes of existence, Latour doesn't get that detailed about technology. Uh, the chapter is suggestive, but it's not very detailed about technology. You're going to find more in Aramis about what Latour really thinks about technology. He does talk in modes about detours, right? That, that, a technology is not just a means to an end, but it forces you to go through some other non-human material, and that affects the nature of your interaction with it. And so if some of you know Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, the point he makes in that book is that, yes, you can talk about capitalism, but uh, a capitalism devoted to oil is very different from a capitalism devoted to coal, right? There's a specificity to those materials that changes life. Uh, changes our, our mode of existence, depending on the specific properties of those media. And, and so just as Simonon will say, just talking about capitalism in general terms misses the effect that specific media and specific technologies have. Um, each kind of technology does a different thing to reality. All right, let's turn to Simonon now. And how am I doing? I've got about 15 or 16 more minutes, looks like. Well, yeah, a bit, a bit more even, you can take 20 or okay. so. All right. Well, for Simondon, even though the word modes is in the title of his book, it's not modes is not really a technical term for Simondon in the same way it is for the tour. He prefers to use the term phases. And he talks about um, technology and religion as being two phases, not in the temporal sense, but in the sense that they are two complementary forms of the breakdown of what he calls magical reality. 
What is magical reality for Simondon? Well, it is the reality in which figure and ground are not really distinct. What would that mean anthropologically? It's hard to say. But uh, Simondon really does get involved in a kind of speculative meta, meta history of the human race and uh, talks about how technology and religion are two complementary sides of an original magic unity. And he's quite specific about the difference between them. And he talks about this in terms of Gestalt psychology. Technology deals with figures and religion deals with grounds. And this is unusual for us in the sense that we, we tend to view religion as something primitive and behind us in the past, and we tend to view technology as something before us in the future. For Simondon, they are two tendencies that remain with us. And aesthetics is some, and also philosophy are somewhat on the side of, of religion here rather than technics. The reason being that magic, uh, sorry, aesthetics and philosophy are both trying to point us back towards the primordial whole in which uh, Simondon very much believes. I've written in some of my work or in a lot of my work about the difference between undermining and overmining. And it's worth refreshing about that here, that if somebody asks you what something is, there are really only two kinds of answers you can give. You can tell them what it's made of or you can tell them what it does. Those are really the two basic forms of knowledge. Any, I've never found a counterexample. Any kind of knowledge that exists is either knowledge about what a thing is made of or knowledge about what it does. The problem with that is that you can never reduce anything either to what it's made of or to what it does. You can't reduce a thing to what it's made of because of emergence. Right? A, th a thing is never totally reducible to the pieces of which it's made, the elements, as Simon Nolan would say. You also can't reduce a thing to what it does, even though that's more popular right now, because a thing is capable of many different uses that have never been imagined or tried. An object is, is deeper than its uses, and it's emergent beyond its, its pieces. And so you're never going to get the thing itself through knowledge. And that has very important implications. Knowledge is always going to come up short of the thing itself. Uh, this is why for Socrates and Plato, uh, philosophy is not a knowledge. Philosophy is philosophia. It's a certain relation to non-knowledge. It's a kind of love of knowledge, love of wisdom without being a wisdom in its own right. And this, there have been attempts in both analytic and continental philosophy for the past, past 400 years to turn philosophy into a kind of knowledge, to make philosophy more scientific, which I think is the last thing we want to do. We want to preserve what is specific to philosophy, which is that it's not a knowledge. It is not a form of mining. It doesn't reduce things downward or upward. Now, what we find in history is that most philosophers do both because reducing a thing downward has obvious drawbacks and, and reducing a thing upward has obvious drawbacks. And so both Sorry, all philosophers tend to use both of them, but there is usually one element that is primary in their thinking. In Latour, it's the overmining element of thinking that is primary. Latour always wants to reduce actors to what they do. A thing is nothing more than whatever it transforms, modifies, perturbs, or creates, as he says in Pandora's Hope. A thing simply is what it does. A thing is not a hidden substance over and above that. Uh, the thing is legible on the surface of the world. This is why Latour once called himself the only French pragmatist. He's very much a member of that tradition. Whereas for Simondon, it's the opposite. Simondon is very, very much has undermining tendencies. You can see this in a couple of ways. One is the fact that Simondon really de-emphasizes the functionalism of technology. He doesn't think the purpose of tools and technology is what's important. Uh, our purposes rather are deflected or changed by the technologies themselves. Technical objects change what we want to do with them. You may buy a certain technology to do a certain thing, but then it changes your life in a different way. So we just got a Tesla nine days ago for the first time, and we bought that because we didn't want to buy gas anymore. We wanted to reduce our fossil fuel consumption. We're aware that Tesla batteries are also problematic, but overall we thought this would help. And what, what it has done it is that it has changed our life in other ways. It has changed the temporal rhythm of our life because charging takes longer. Uh, charging a car, rearranges your day differently, right? I have to come home, plug in the car, go upstairs and then go back to the parking garage six hours later to pull out of the charger so that I don't, I don't get charged for idling time. Um, so it's changing my life in other ways uh, that I was not expecting when we bought the car. In any case, uh, Heidegger and, uh, sorry, Latour and Simondon are different in this sense. Simondon is also, not only is he a, an opponent of functionality and opponents of finality, he is very much a believer in a primal whole. He has this idea that originally everything was whole and it's somehow broken to pieces. 
that is something we see as far back in Western philosophy as, as uh, well, Anaxagoras is the most famous, this idea that there was an aperon and then Nous, this powerful mind, started thinking and it made the aperon rotate and break into pieces. Now, there's a problem with that. Uh, other philosophers who believe that, whether that, whether in pre-Socratic thoughts or in later times, you know, the young Levinas has an idea like this too, that being is simply a, an indeterminate ilia until the human mind breaks it into pieces. The problem with that is it's hard to get from a primal indeterminate whole to individual entities. How do you get from one to the other? Is, why would the original whole break up into pieces? Simondon seems to recognize there's a problem with that. And so he tries to make the primal whole not entirely primal and not entirely whole. He says that the whole is reticulated. It's the surface of the whole is wrinkled. It has pre-individual tendencies that aren't quite individual. But then I, in my opinion, that simply moves the problem back a step. How do you get from a primal whole to the wrinkles? And how do the wrinkles different? Uh, how are the wrinkles differentiated from fully fledged objects? And as we know from Simondon's work on individuation, he does think there's a pre-individual or pre-objectual realm. I'm not sure what it gains him, though, to say that uh, the whole is reticulated rather than broken up into objects. I think it simply pushes the whole problem back a step. How do you get from indeterminacy to determinacy? I don't think it can be done. I think the whole, there is no whole. I think it has to be articulated in advance. And that has some implications we could get into more if this were a lecture focused on metaphysics. But um, Simonon also thinks technology is discontinuous, which I think makes an uneasy fit with his idea that technologies are trajectories. Uh, let me spend a little time on this. Um, using an analogy from the theory of evolution. Because of course, Darwin's theory of evolution is the standard uh, theory. And in, in Darwin's theory, of course, evolution is thought of as being gradual, phyletic gradualism, as it's sometimes called, that uh, uh, more fit organisms will likely give birth to more fit offspring. And so there will be differential survival over the, over the course of time. Most organisms do not live to successfully reproduce. Uh, and so uh, over time, big fish will have bigger baby fish and bigger baby fish will eat smaller baby fish. And so over time, the fish will become bigger or faster. This is the standard model. Now, in the late 20th century, of course, there were several uh, challenges to this. The one that I think goes best with Simonton is the punctuated equilibrium of Eldridge and Gould. The idea that the fossil record does not support gradual evolution. If you look at the fossil record, you're going to see a very sudden emergence of species. And that this is closely associated for Eldridge and Gould with um, sudden change of climate or environment. Most famous example being the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. That was a very sudden destruction of dinosaurs, but a very favorable event for mammals, which had been these kind of despicable small parasites scurrying into the dark corners where the reptiles couldn't eat them and then became a very dominant life form. Also for birds, the only living descendants of the dinosaurs, or the, the, the most, let's say, most widespread descendants of the dinosaurs. That's one example. The other example that's talked about in the literature is snapping shrimp, as they call them. Uh, North and South America became connected only a short while ago in, ge in geological terms. Right? North and South America were separate land masses. Once they uh, became connected, you had a shrimp population that became divided of uh, the Gulf of Mexico side and the Pacific side. And what they find now is that if you bring male and female shrimp from the two sides of the Isthmus of Panama next to each other, instead of engaging in courtship rituals, they snap at each other violently. <clears throat> and it's quite possible that they're not even, not just hostile to each other, but they can't mate at all, which is one of the definitions of what constitutes a species, a mating population that excludes other living organisms. And so that would be another example of how a sudden climactic change, the closing of the Isthmus of Panama, would help create a new species. And this goes along with Ernst Meyer's theory of allopatric speciation, the idea that a certain population becomes isolated from its parent species. And because of unique selection pressures in that isolated location where it is, it's pressured to evolve very quickly. And then in some cases, it manages to spread back into the range of its ancestral population and either coexist with the ancestral population or wipes it out. And so you get things like desert cardinals. You know, we have these beautiful red birds, cardinals, in the part of the United States where I grew up. 
Then if you go to the desert, say Arizona or northern Mexico, you're going to find gray cardinals. They look like cardinals, except that they're gray, no doubt for camouflage reasons, so that they can't be eaten by hawks and eagles. And uh, you can also find intermediate forms where you have gray cardinals with splotches of red over them, which are presumably making the transition. In any case, this is the, the evolutionary theory that works best with Simon's on. But what I'm going to suggest today is that the better model, the one I find more interesting for speciation and biology and possibly for technology, is Lynn Margulis' methodology of symbiosis. The idea that you get a new species when you get two previously separate life forms that came together. And since this isn't going to happen that often at the macro level, uh, Margulis talks about the level of bacteria and viruses as being the level where most evolution occurs. So as a graduate student, she made this, uh, referred to this famous experiment where they split a tank of fruit flies into hot fruit flies and cold fruit flies by adjusting the temperature on both sides of the tank. And after a certain number of months, the fruit flies were no longer the same species. They were no longer able to mate with each other. And the scientists dissected the poor fruit flies to try to figure out why this happened. And they said, oh, it's, the, the experiment is ruined. There's a virus in the cold fruit flies. That's why they were able to survive in the cold. And Lynn Margulis's innovation was to say, no, that's precisely the point. That's the only example of evolution we've seen in the laboratory, and it's precisely because of a virus. So that's where we need to look for evolution as occurring most often. It's the, the symbiosis of two previously independent things. And she ultimately argued that the, the um, uh, eukaryotic cell, the cell with organelles in it, evolved in this way from the combination of a prokaryotic cell and various vi various viruses or bacteria. Now, what's the relevance of that to technology? I'm going to say in a second that I think uh, the convergence of previously separate lines of technology is probably a better place to look than looking at self-enclosed trajectories. Uh, what is the problem with the idea of technology as a trajectory? Well, it is interesting to look at how a certain technology evolved over time. But ultimately, um, what is going to link that trajectory together? If you say a cer certain technologies occur in a lineage because humans say so, that's a very idealist way of doing it. And Simonton wouldn't want that. Simonton wants to think that techn technical objects close in on each other. They resist human attempts to categorize them. And so the trajectory has to be something internal to the technology, not something arbitrarily posited by humans. Okay, but what is it that links all those different moments of the trajectory? Well, a trajectory never exists in an individual moment. So there has to be something actual that lasts through all those moments on the trajectory. Otherwise, we have a different technology. There comes a certain point where we could say that the technologies become new technologies. Was the atomic bomb really part of a trajectory? Well, not really. If you've just seen Oppenheimer, what made the atomic bomb was, in the case of the Hiroshima bomb, the symbiosis, very, very uh, destructive one in this case, between uh, uranium and a cannon. Right? The, the way the Hiroshima bomb worked is you had an almost critical mass of uranium missing a plug-sized hole, a plug-shaped hole, sorry, and then a cannon fired that missing plug of uranium very so fast into the, the sphere that it formed a sphere large enough to create a critical mass and start a chain reaction and blow up the, detonate the bomb. Whereas with the uh, Hiroshima bomb, it had to do with implosion. They had plutonium and they simply had to implode it uh, accurately enough so that the plutonium formed a sphere, a sphere and also detonated in its own way. So you, you had, in one case, a symbiosis of uranium with a cannon. In the second case, a symbiosis with plutonium and ex precision, precision explosives designed to cause an implosion. Uh, and this is something Simonton doesn't quite give us the resources to do because he's he's more interested in individual self-enclosed trajectories of, of technological objects rather than convergences between separate ones. Just a few other things that uh, Simonton has to say about technology. He said it's discontinuous and made of leaps. All right, again, I pointed out around, the around five that? minutes. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that that. I've mentioned that there's a tension between the idea that technology is a trajectory and the idea that it's discontinuous. If it goes in leaps, then it shouldn't be a continuous trajectory. There should be something that happens that makes it jump. And I'm suggesting that that is a moment in time where two technologies converge and are brought together. Um, surprisingly, given how, how bad a reputation essence has in philosophies these days, Simon Don thinks technical objects do have an essence, and that essence is latent, it's hidden. It's not something that even technicians know. 
They're simply using a technology for practical reasons. The philosopher is needed to try to define the essence of a technology. He says technological trajectories must be latent and stable, so they should be hidden. If they're not latent, then he says there's a fatal hypertele, which means there's a fatal situation in which a technology is too devoted to a specific purpose or specific use. And more concretely, he's very critical of cars for this reason. He says cars are under so much social pressure and under so much design pressure that cars are rarely a source of technological innovation, he says. And that might be debatable. But he thinks cars are too often governed by social uses and personal uses. And for this reason, the technology doesn't have a trajectory of its own. And I'm still thinking about that with respect to the Tesla, uh, whether it offers anything new that isn't a social use. I haven't decided yet. And again, he says a technical essence begins absolutely. There is one given moment in time when it appears, uh, which again surprises me that he didn't see that that challenges the notion of a trajectory. The atomic bomb really did begin at a certain point in history. You can't say that there was an implicit atomic bomb in the 1890s somewhere. There just wasn't. It wasn't technically or physically possible until there was a combination of different technologies in the early 1940s, late 1930s at the earliest. Finally, um, Simondon distinguishes between the elements, the individual, and the ensemble in technology. And I'm just going to say one thing about this. Uh, Simondon makes the point that elements are what survive. Technologies are all doomed to die, just like philosophies are all doomed to die. And what survives are the elements, that there's a certain modularity to technology, just like philosophy, that you save certain useful components, uh, which means that technology isn't really a system any more than philosophy is really a system. Uh, I wrote an article about Badiou recently, and I was talking about how there's there's an aspect of his theory of events that I really like, and it's not as popular as either his devotion to set theory or his devotion to Maoism, and yet believing in some aspects of Badiou's theory of events does not uh, necessitate that you accept either set, th set theory as the foundation of ontology or that you accept Maoism. And Ma Badiou wouldn't like that, but it is not the fate of philosophies to be accepted or rejected in total. And the same is true of technologies. That certain bits and pieces of technologies will be brought out, uh, transposed into other kinds of technology, and uh, that's a, a typical Simondonian insight. Now, as for individual and ensemble, what's interesting here is that uh, Simondon says humans used to be technological individuals. We used to be the mediator, the, the entity that was holding all the tools and using them together in a kind of symphony, whereas now humans are more likely to either be part of an ensemble right, where we're all part of a database or we're all part of uh, our smartphones are all linked into a Uber network. So either we are elements of another technology or else we are the mediators that create ensembles out of different technologies. We are the ones who integrate databases with airplanes, with cargo delivery schedules and so forth. And so the human role with respect to technology is changing. And humans tend to have a certain amount of nostalgia for our former role, which was the role of the, the craftsperson, uh, the bricoleur who could handle many different tools at once. OK, uh, and I've mentioned already that the idea of independent lineages of technology and independent trajectories runs the risk of missing what's important. And I just want to speak briefly about McLuhan, and then I'll, I'll stop with one thought about Margulis. Uh, as mentioned, Simondon thinks very highly of the figure ground relation. This is very central to Simondon's philosophy, just as it is to Gestalt psychology. And he thinks, again, that religion is what deals with the ground and technology is what deals with figures. He thinks objects emerged as technical objects. Well, um, McLuhan also deals with the figure ground relation. As mentioned, McLuhan looks like someone who's a theorist of the ground who despises the figure. McLuhan looks like someone who's not interested at all in the content of media. And yet, what we get in the later McLuhan, if you look at his, the book uh, Laws of Media that he co-authored with his son Eric, uh, there's this structure of the tetrad in which there's four different terms. Every artifact, he says, has enhancement, obsolescence, retrieval, and reversal. Enhancement means that every technology emphasizes something. Obsolescence means that it de-emphasizes something else. And that's easy to see, right? That the invention of the car de-emphasized the horse and buggy but emphasized a lot of different things, like individual autonomy, it emphasized parking lots, it emphasized a certain kind of servitude to car payments and insurance payments. What's interesting is that in McLuhan, to emphasize something means to make it invisible, and to de-emphasize something means to make it visible. So horse and, horse and buggy 
with the invention of the car, become less useful, but they become more picturesque in a way. We start recognizing them more as visual figures than we did when we were relying on them. Horse, the horse and buggy become something historically charming and quaint that you ride in when you're a tourist visiting a, an old city somewhere. But then the other two moments of McLuhan's tetrad have to do with the dynamic genesis of technology. Those are what he calls retrieval and reversal. Reversal is what happens when a medium becomes too saturated, when a technological object becomes too numerically overwhelming. So too many cars, suddenly we have inconvenience rather than convenience. We have traffic jams, we have air pollution. And so the car might actually reverse into a love of mass transit at some point, uh, just as climate change might, if, if we decide that cars are destroying us all slowly. But then there's also the movement of retrieval, which where, that can change reality, which is where McLuhan thinks people he calls the artists in the widest sense can take out of date media like horse and buggies or vinyl LP records or uh, lava lamps and bring them in, back into fashion somehow by recreating them as a living medium rather than a dead one. And I mentioned that because one of the usual criticisms of McLuhan by theorists of technology is that he's a technological determinist. Why do people say McLuhan is a technological determinist, especially in the United Kingdom, don't, uh, for various reasons? Partly because Raymond Williams of the Birmingham School said that um, McLuhan's a technological determinist because it's the hidden medium of the technology that controls us, according to McLuhan. And so it seems like he leaves little room for autonomous individual decisions. The reason that's not true is because McLuhan gives us a lot of leeway to choose our next medium. It's not determined what the next medium is going to be after the car. That's a topic for human creativity and human invention. But I wanted to say that I think the biggest weakness of McLuhan might be his idea of technology as what he calls, in non-gender neutral language, the extensions of man. In other words, every technology is an extension of some sort of human faculty. And I want to ask, isn't the opposite really the case? Isn't technology really about the internalization of outside entities by humans. And again, this would fit very well with Margulis's theory of evolution, in which our evolution happens not through some closed off human trajectory of evolution, but through various viruses, bacteria, tools that we pick up and that transform the human essence uh, in some cases in the way they do that. And I wrote about this in one of my books, Immaterialism, about the Dutch East India Company. Some of you might know it. And what I tried to look at there was what are the weaknesses of actor network theory in looking at history, looking at social history? And I, I see the biggest weakness as being the idea that a thing is judged by its actions. And so according to actor network theory, the history of the Dutch East India Company, you should be looking at the biggest battles, the biggest business deals, the most influential this and that. But looking at the largest influence of a thing is looking at the effect of that thing on outside things. How can we find a more internal model that affects the evolution of a thing itself. And that's where I brought the concept of symbiosis into social history. I, I identified five or six moments in the history of the Dutch East India Company in which it engaged in symbiosis with an external entity in a way that transformed the company irreversibly. And uh, two of those were geographical locations, right? The, the Volk, as you call it in Dutch, uh, once it uh, controlled the Sunda Straits, and once it controlled the other strait, uh, the Northern and Southern Straits, the, other, the name of the other escapes me at the moment, uh, those enabled it to attain a new level, level of reality by unifying the old Chinese and Arab trade routes. It made the, it made the Dutch East India Company something different from the former, uh, sorry, Arab trade routes and the former Chinese trade routes. There was also Jan Peterson Kern, the most controversial but also most effective governor general of the of the Dutch East India Company, the world's first corporation and the world's first joint stock company in which even middle class people own shares. Uh, the conflict between the liberal atmosphere of the Dutch Republic and the relatively illiberal means needed to maintain the success of the Dutch East India Company and thereby to, to maintain Dutch independence from Spain in that period. The Dutch needed a lot to generate a lot of wealth. And Kern was quite uh, callous in a way about saying, we have to monopolize the spice trade in, in Southeast Asia. We have to violently repel any other European nations that want to get involved, such as the Portuguese, the British, the Spanish, the French. We have to be able to be willing to use violence. 
And we also have to monopolize trade between Asian countries themselves. We have to become the universal middleman of Asian trade. And this caused a lot of queasiness back in Amsterdam, of course. This is not how the Dutch Republic wanted to see itself. So what did Kuhn do? He forced their hands. As Kuhn departed from his first term as governor general, he saw to it that his successor staged a massacre of British officials, invited them to a dinner and rather uh, ignobly killed them all. What was he trying to do there? He was trying to force the hand of the government back in Amsterdam and make impossible any peace with the British. Uh, the you know, Kuhn had gone through all this work to try to glorify the Dutch company at the expense of the other European companies. And then he found that the government in Amsterdam wanted to make a peace treaty with the British and give them a certain cut of the profits. Kuhn saw this as a disaster for the independent Netherlands. And so he simply forced the hand of the company and deliberately manufactured a crisis with the UK. And then there's one final symbiosis I talked about, which is a very interesting one, uh, which it turned out that around 1650, the Dutch East India Company realized it was making a lot more money on trade with Asian countries than on sending stuff back and forth to Amsterdam. So they switched their business model from large ships capable of going back and forth to Europe towards uh, smaller draft ships able to go up Asian rivers and dock at river ports. And so that was a kind of combination of their old Dutch ships with uh, the geography of Asian rivers. And that is a very good form of symbiosis. And if you look at the history of technology, you see so much of this, not, not so much independent lineages as the combination of previously, previously independent ones. Computer with a typewriter keyboard is a famous example, never had to happen. Cars with solar panels, we're starting to see that now. If we end up buying our own house instead of living in an apartment, we could buy solar panels and we could fuel our Tesla solely with solar energy at some point. Sorry, Graham, too, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we have about a bit more than 30 minutes uh, left. Yeah. So could I could I ask you to kind of wrap up? Then we have some time for yeah. discussion. I'm on my last card. Sorry, I just give my last three examples. Drones with missiles. I remember the moment. I don't remember the exact year. It was probably towards the beginning of the Afghanistan war when drones, which had been seen purely as spy devices, were coupled with missiles uh, to become a terrorist strike device, and for some people, a civilian terror device. Uh, the flat deck of a ship with aircraft, aircraft carriers a human tooth with metallic amalgams and so forth. So I think this might be a more productive way of looking at the history of technology than considering the history of technology in terms of independent trajectories with their own essences. And so I'll leave it there. And I'm sorry if I cut into the discussion time too much. All right, thank you so very what, much, uh, Graham. That's uh, sure. not, a, not a problem, actually, the timing. Uh, I let you go on for a little bit because it turns out that Clemens uh, couldn't make it, or at least unless he showed up, but I, I don't think he's he couldn't make it. Uh, here. Uh, he was uh, like the respondent I asked to um, first uh, respond, uh, to be first responder, uh, yes. if you like. But I already see that the chat is um, starting with uh, uh, several questions. Uh, Brony, good to see you, by the way. Uh, uh, could I ask people to also turn on their... Uh, cameras. I think the the bandwidth is sufficient these days, and then uh, we can also put some uh, put some faces with all the questions. I think this makes for a nicer discussion. Uh, Brony, can we uh, start with you? Um, yeah, the question is here in the chat, but maybe you want to uh, just either read it out loud or rephrase. Uh, it's been a, a little while since you uh, said it. Are you talking to me, uh, Jochem? Yes. Yeah, OK. Hi. Yeah, I'm Bron or Bronisław Lichinski. Yeah, great talk, uh, Graham. Uh, yeah, so um, in a way, I think my question got a bit strong, uh, strong clear in my mind as you were talking, although I wrote it about halfway through. And the question was basically whether you think that technology is, you know, without necessarily you know, going back to the idea of essences or teleology in evolution, but, you know, following your uh, analogies with biological evolution, whether technology is showing tendencies on our planet to evolve in particular directions, particularly towards those terms, you, you towards more clearly manifesting those features you talked about early on about being monistic and, and systematically integrated. And I'm thinking here, particularly in terms of the way that individual technical individuals emerge you know are created are built how much they depend on the interconnectedness of of different technological kind of you know place 
I think that it's certainly was. And the power and the energy. And all that thing of powers in the way you say. And I'm, I'm thinking here particularly, I was inspired particularly by Peter Haft's idea of the technosphere with its, you know, as an emergent Earth system. But also, I think a lot of Simon Don's ideas, and you talked about the different, you know, the elements and the assemblages maybe are also can give us some tools to think with. Yeah, I suspect that if we look at the history of technology, we're going to see cycles of, of greater monism and then greater fragmentation of technologies over and over again. Um, I think certainly there was a tendency with the oil economy to unify everything. Oil became a kind of the universal mediator for all technologies, and that's part of a big part of why we're in the mess we're in now. But then, of course, there are also counterexamples, such as you know, we think of the Internet as a way to connect with each other, different countries. But of course, the Internet was designed as a, as a disconnected technology with the specter of nuclear war in the background, that if parts of the net were destroyed, other parts would continue to function. Um, so I would guess that right now we're in a phase where people are trying to disconnect and disaggregate technologies. And I'm not sure whether that's going to uniformly be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think part of what the ecological turn is doing is getting people to think more locally, getting people to think in terms of a plurality of more self-sustainable systems that aren't connected to the whole monistic grid of technology. And so it's an interesting question. Um, Heidegger, in a way, is the theorist of the gloomy monism of technology, that everything's simply standing reserve and he doesn't have much to tell us about individual technologies, to the point that he infamously says that the manufacture of corpses in the gas chamber is ontologically no different from mechanized food production and so forth. That's, uh, and it's not so much that Heidegger is gloomy. I think if Heidegger were optimistic about technology, the same problem would be there, that he's not very good about talking about specific ones. Whereas I think Simondon and, and, and McLuhan and figures like that are much better at analyzing the specific contours of, of definite technologies. But as far as the trend of where we're heading, I would guess that we're in a part of the cycle now, historical cycle, that's trying to disaggregate total systems and make them more uh, self-contained. That's my, my best guess. And uh, that the global, the global village, the globalization of culture maybe is already fragmenting a bit. Um, maybe we're seeing again the emergence of more independent cultures around the world that are able to communicate more quickly around the world because of the internet, but which are still somehow self-contained and fragmented compared to late 20th century pop culture, which was very global. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, I muted. Um, moving on, thank you for that. Uh, it's my new colleague, Georgios. You also had a um, you also had yeah. question. Please go ahead, uh, Georgios. Yes, hello. Go ahead, uh, Georgios. Hello, thank you, Joachim, and, and many thanks, Professor Harman. Um, yeah, I, I, I find this kind of, uh, I, I mean, you, you, you place so many uh, thoughts on, on, a, on a mat in a very clear way, I, and I love this. Um, and I find interesting what you said around occasionalism, very much so. Um, I wonder whether you think that Whitehead would also kind of, whether, to put it differently, Latour is, is drawing, in a way, theoretically, his explanation around Aramis from kind of a, um, a white Hadian uh, onto epistemological principle, right? Uh, the, the kind of, uh, uh, that the, the process is always like uh, under, un conditioned by a certain constancy. Is that, is that how you see it as well? And then the, the, the question here is, OK, well, you know, you, you write a book 90 percent new like McLuhan and maybe it's not good for the times, uh, but, you know, maybe it's, it's good for like 50, 100 years later on. Maybe you need to create a, a language and an audience. Right. So we see how, let's say, Deleuze has been absorbed by academic discourse, it has become like, you know, you have all the handbooks, you have, effectively, this is the kind of kind of positive, so to say, a positive science Deleuze, like Deleuze has become, um, you know, instrumentalized um, and become part of the part of the discourse. And so the question is, um, you know, is, is that kind of context dependent? I'm also thinking there's certain things that, um, you know, like you take Heidegger, for example, obviously every word he uses is very simple, deliberately simple, right? Uh, but then uh, the text becomes very complex, 
Mm-hmm. And, and people who don't read German, they find it, uh, or, or who are German, they, they think that reading Heidegger in the original is very difficult. It's not. His language is very simple. But what mm-hmm. emerges out of that, so the question is, what is the constant element in this, right? What, what, is, the, what is the type of constancy? Where, is all constancy relevant, if you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. The, the first part of the question, I'm not sure I got, though, about whiteheads. Yes. Could you repeat that? Yeah, so do you think that um, that, that Whitehead would, would also um, say that, yes, for any type of uh, change, you require a certain permanence uh, upon which this kind of change supervenes, if you like? And would you say that um, Latour is drawing on, on, on that position also from Whitehead? That's my question on this point. Right. The, the problem Latour and Whitehead have in describing stability is that they don't really allow for any inner core of a thing. They, because for them, a thing exists here and now, and it includes all of its relations, all of its effects, all of its qualities. So in a way, they're treating objects as bundles of qualities, kind of like Hume. In the Tour's case, they're bundles of actions. In Whitehead's case, they're bundles of relations. There isn't really an inner core to things that continues. You just have to kind of look at a trajectory of things across time, and it becomes almost subjective in a way, that some outside observer has to decide what lasted. There's nothing in the thing that lasts. The thing disappears every instant and is recreated. Whereas, you know, Simondon doesn't go that far. He's more of a thinker of continuity. And so a thing, a trajectory can have an essence that unfolds across time. Um, so that's what I would say to the first part of the question. As for, as for the second part of the question, I think it was about how novelty loses its novelty. You talked about how Deleuze has become an institutionalized part of the discourse. I saw this happen with Derrida when I was young, because uh, for my professors who were, say, 10 to 15 years older than I am, Derrida was this new thing, this liberating force who had freed them from whatever, traditional phenomenology, whatever they didn't like when they were young. But then Derrida was already an institution by the time I was in graduate school. That's what I was tired of. And Deleuze, it's becoming that way now, too. Deleuze was so wonderfully irreverent when he burst into the, onto the big stage in the mid-1990s. Uh, when I started graduate school in 1990, Deleuze was viewed as kind of an entertaining fringe figure, sort of like Baudrillard, right? He wasn't at the level of Derrida and Foucault. And now you've got people calling him one of the greatest philosophers of all time. It's, it's been a, remarkable for me to see that happen, because that's not what people were saying even in the early 90s. That's That's a last 30 years, 25, 30 years, people have been saying that. So what happens? Well, Simondon describes that uh, uh, progression himself. He talks about how early tools or sorry, early technologies are very abstract because they involve correlating what are actually separate technologies. So you've got uh, at a mill, you've got a water wheel connected to two stones and you put wheat wheat seeds under those stones and then you hook the stones to the water wheel and it grinds the stones. It's almost comical in a way. You have these very separate technologies, the water wheel and the stones and or the, the windmill and the stones. But then over time, technologies tend to become concretized, as he says. And what he seems to mean by concretized is they become more relational. The relations of the parts tend to refer to each other more directly. They tend to become more tightly integrated. And you need less human control to keep the technology operating properly so that um, very few of us know what's going on inside of our laptops right now. Uh, that, that because they become so tightly integrated and it's a basic technology, it's almost a commodity now. You can get computers very cheaply. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents briefly owned a restaurant and they bought their first calculator, which could only do plus, minus, multiply, divide, and it was $400, which was an immense amount of money in 1974-75. And now they give away calculators when you open a bank account, solar-powered calculators. So things become more and more tightly integrated, less innovative, and more like commodities. And so in a way, the, the interesting part of the history of any technology or even any philosophy is the time before it's recognized, the time before it becomes integrated into the society. Once it becomes integrated into the society, it becomes the, the topic of management in a sense, efficiency. So um, the Apple computer company was this visionary corporation at first, doing something that nobody had ever done before, that was kind of the ad, the attitude of Steve Jobs, even though he could be very 
unpleasant person to deal with sometimes. He simply had a knack for coming up with very innovative ideas. He, he returns to Apple from his years at Next, and he creates this candy-looking iMac, which people compared to Barbie's computer after they'd had several years of boring beige computers. This is what Steve Jobs does. And now it's in the hands of Tim Cook, who's more the efficient manager. They don't really introduce new products anymore, right? They they improve the iPhone incrementally every year. They improve the laptop incrementally every, every couple of years. That simply seems to be the fate of every invention. And so you, with philosophies too, there comes to be a dangerous period. Um, I actually enjoyed the period before speculative realism and object-oriented ontology were very known. I had more interesting conversations. People weren't as sure they knew what it meant. Um, nowadays, people have certain prejudices. Uh, and so I, it feels like I'm under pressure now to do surprising things and shocking things just so that people will listen to me and not assume they know what I'm going to say. One of my favorite interviews of Foucault He's not my favorite philosopher, but he has a lot of great interviews. He's a brilliant interview. He has this one interview where he chose to remain anonymous for that reason. Some of you might know it. It's called The Masked Philosopher. He did an interview where he didn't want it to be known who he was because he said, nobody listens to me anymore. They know what Foucault thinks. And so I want to remove my name from this. And so, yeah, I think this is part of why established people are often more boring than young insurgents and why new technologies are often more interesting. Nonetheless, I tend not to be an early adopter because I like to see things stabilize a bit first before I invest resources and things. I tend not to read new books when they come out. I tend to wait a few years uh, because I tend to worry about the effects of fashion when new things come. There's a lot, always a lot of hype about a new thing. And so I kind of like that intermediary period where it's not old and established yet, but it's also not so new that the fashion seekers are on the bandwagon. So um, um, I like to wait five or six years after a thing becomes first known before I study it. Anyway, I, that might be a rambling way to answer your second question, but but uh, that's how I would do it. That no, nothing can be innovative forever. Nothing can be novel forever. Everything becomes old. That's true of all of us. And old and new technologies, just like old and new philosophies, have different roles to play in the world. It's also right. why philosophy will never stop, because what interests your professors is never going to be what interests you. What interests your professors is always going to look like establishment knowledge, and that's never going to satisfy young people. So history is generational, I would say, inherently generational. That goes all the way back to Ibn Khaldun, the great Arab historian of the Middle Ages, who talks about the inevitable decay of generations. I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think it's always decay, but uh, the way that ideas of your parents always begin to look boring and old. And just look in the United States, the difference in opinions about Joe Biden between Democrats like my parents and Democrats like my nephews who can't stand Joe Biden. They see him as a doddering 80 year old man. My parents just want to give him a chance. Anyway, okay. I should stop giving okay. examples. Uh, let's um, let's move on. Let me see in the Chat. Oh, I think actually the next question is uh, by myself, which if uh, that's allowed, I will actually change it into two questions. Um, I was, yeah, going back to the metaphysics of it all a little bit. So on the one hand, I was wondering about this notion of mode that you, how you interpreted Latour, mode as a zone of reality, cut off from other zones of reality. Um, how should I read this genitive? Here, what does it mean that a zone is of reality? Does it mean that it springs forth from reality? Is it a way of, in a more Kantian sense, of say, uh, schematizing uh, reality? Um, so yeah. So what is the meaning of this "off" here in your interpretation? Because I have the, the kind of hunch, but I'm I'm not sure about this. So um, yeah, I would I would love to hear your reaction to this as well. That this could be relevant for the kind of symbiosis Margulis model. Um, that you're after. And then a second question that is related um, and that relates to Simon Don as well. Um, how exactly then should we differentiate, say, your symbiosis, which is in a way maybe a, a form of integration, although um, I can understand that that's a little bit difficult as well. Um, but just listening now to you about concretization, couldn't one argue that that is also a form of symbiosis? I'm thinking about the famous Green Balter being that in a way also integrates the environment in its 
design while at the same time in Simondon requiring this kind of punctuated equilibrium step of invention, right? Or in the uh, imagination and invention book that has recently also been translated. He talks about a, a really simple example, like a boulder uh, in the road, right? Where like it, it as it were, gathers uh, people together who cannot uh, cross the road, but then at mm -hmm. some point there are sufficient of them so they can like make the invention of putting it aside, um, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, how would that relate to the uh, symbiosis? Uh, model on the one hand and the genitive of the zones of reality on the other. Yeah, one of the things I've always been suspicious of philosophically is holism in it, when it goes too far. Uh, in the sense that it's a very easy thing to say everything's connected to everything, everything's connected. When I was an undergraduate, I heard a lecture saying that's what being an educated person means, to learn that everything is connected. Well, maybe, but some things are a lot more connected than others. You know, the Torah in Aramis has that funny line where the guy pounds his table and says the pounding of the table did not move the position of Aristotle's metaphysics on his bookshelf. Uh, the idea that, that reality is formed of systems that close off from what is outside of them. Not that it's ever absolute, because you can always open up a system with enough work and reconnect it to other things. But there is a certain sense in which the world is made of discontinuous systems. And you get that in Margulis's idea of uh, a cell forms a symbiosis with virus or bacteria. It's not every life form that does that. It's only the cell that happened to make that symbiosis. It's not that the virus affects everything. It affects one particular thing. Uh, one of the most powerful lectures I heard in my life was the late James Lovelock in Dublin in 2009, at the height of his pessimism at the time. He later became more optimistic. Um, that's back when he said that there's only gonna be a billion people left by 2100 mostly clustered near the poles and in Ireland and Japan and uh, New Zealand. But uh, you would expect an ecological thinker or a Gaia thinker like Lovelock to say, everything's connected. All of the earth is a giant organism, but that's that's not what he says. What he, what he says and said that day is, there are three specific systems we need to worry about uh, that are going to create a dangerous positive feedback loop. One of them is the death of the rainforests. One of them is the death of algae in the oceans. And the last one is the melting of the permafrost in Siberia and Canada, which is going to release even more CO2 and methane into the, into the atmosphere. Those are the three systems we need to worry about. So it's not like each and every action a human performs uh, is necessarily destroying the climate. There are three specific things to worry about. And uh, um, there's also the idea of not letting systems reach a critical point. So for example, there's a lot of talk about how the policy shouldn't be to put out every forest fire or to stop every war, because if you put out every forest fire and stop every war, you're creating a critical situation where the next war becomes a world war or the next forest fire burns everything. And so the discontinuity between systems is always important. And that's, you know, of course, that's not new. A lot There's a whole 20th century current of systems theory, whether it's Luhmann or Maturana and Varela, about systems closing off from the outside world and maintaining a homeostasis. And it's something that Latour's actor network theory is not as strong at as it could be, because since he's relational, you wonder where the network of relations stops. Um, he doesn't allow for a thing to exist in non-relational form, whereas even Simonzon does, because he talks about how a technology closes itself off to some extent from the world. It becomes an essence. It is a trajectory across time, but it's, it's closed off spatially at least in terms of its relations to other things. So zone of reality for me would be simply the way that a part of reality closes off from the rest of reality. And I think that's going to be sudden because either the door to your house is open or it's closed. And if it's, if it's open, even a crack, there's gonna be cold air coming in. Um, if the door of your house is closed, that's going to be a closed climactic system if the thermostat is, is on. And, um, I think it's often more helpful when looking at history or looking at technologies or philosophies to look at lines that are not crossed. And a lot of times I think there are premature calls for holism. And I'll give you one example. Um, you get a lot of people now saying, uh, we shouldn't just talk about Western philosophy, we should talk about all the philosophical traditions of the world, which sounds completely unobjectionable. And I've tried to teach Chinese and Indian philosophy the last couple of years just to give my students a wider range of options. But 
What I would say is instead, first things first, the first thing to incorporate is, is Islamic philosophy because Islamic philosophy is part of the Western tradition, even though we don't see it that way. Islamic philosophy is based on Plato and Aristotle and on Abrahamic religions. So Islamic philosophy necessarily has a major connection with European philosophy and it had a lot of influence on European philosophy. If you try to unify the discourses of European philosophy with Asian, with Indian or Chinese philosophy, that is a much trickier thing to do. Maybe it's a little easier with Indian than Chinese, but there are still some fundamentally different assumptions. You know, for instance, the, the unification of theory and praxis in Indian philosophy, all the Indian philosophers are talking about breathing. Tell me one Western philosopher who talks about breathing. I don't even think Schopenhauer does that. And so there are just some fundamentally different assumptions in these different traditions, and it's not as easy as people think to say, hey, European philosophy and Chinese philosophy are both philosophy. We should talk about them both in the same breath. Well, there's a lot of work still to be done. The connection needs to be built and it takes work. Just like it took work to build the tunnel between England and France, you can't just say, oh, England and France are both Europe, they shouldn't be disconnected. Well, they are disconnected by water. And so someone had to build the tunnel and it took a lot of, of cost and a lot of engineering expertise. And I see it that way with philosophies too. If you try to link two philosophers, it's always very hard. And here's one other thought I have about this. Uh, one of my professors at DePaul, Michael Nass, made a very interesting point in a dissertation proposal defense that I've never forgotten. You might find this useful too. There was a student whose dissertation was going to be a comparison of Merleau-Ponty and Schelling. And, and Professor Nass said, I'm totally convinced by the common elements in Merleau-Ponty and Schelling. He made that very clear. But he said with comparison and contrast writings, often it's the contrast that are the most interesting. So what you're not doing in this dissertation is telling us how Schelling and Merleau-Ponty are not compatible. That's actually more interesting. In a way, it's too easy just to say that this person's saying the same as this person. It's better to say, where do they clash? Um, so that's another point against easy holism. Okay, yeah. So, uh, no, that's that's nice. I like the idea of closed off, but maybe it's also worth thinking about closed off as a kind of relation. And I think then we're yes. quite close to what Heidegger is talking about with Zeins Vergessenheit and the forgetfulness of being and, and those kinds of things. But anyway, we have 10 minutes. Maybe we can do two more. Uh, sure. uh, Renzo Filinich, sorry for butchering your name. If I do so, could I ask you to yeah, yeah, was good. keep this within, within yes. five minutes? Because we also have a question from uh, Larissa Bolta and then... We thank can. you. Thank you very much. I, I want to try to be brief. Yes, my, my question, thank you very much, first of all, Graham, for your lucid, uh, lucid reflections. It, it's in the same direction, my question, that you are uh, thinking in the terms of symbiosis. I was thinking in, in the aspect of how understand technology as an ambient in this, in this symbiotic, symbiotic aspect, no? as an ambient or as a general ecology, as a statement by Henry Ford. No, uh, as a continuing natural continuum technology in this aspect. But my question referring to you, Rahan, is how do you see this in, in uh, ambient or general ecology in the aspect of embodiment and emergency nowadays, in the thinking in individuation process, no, or trust individuation process, no? How do you see that? How do you lose this? Because uh, for Stigler, this individuation is cut, no? We have a state of shock in, in the aspect of technology because we are not going in the same uh, velocity or in the same aspect of this uh, organological aspects. So how you how you see that in, in this balance between ambience, general ecologies, how, how you lose that? Graham, and thank you again. Thank you, yeah. Ambience is a very interesting topic. And of course, this whole theory of atmospheres has caught fire. Gernot Burma and other people. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about this. Um, Technology, of course, isn't just made of objects. It's also made of environments. And uh, since I teach in an architecture school now, I think about this a lot. My colleague, David Rue, made the very good point that architecture, we think of it as this kind of discrete discipline that you can either be interested or not interested in. David Rue points out that architecture is everyone's first contact with reality. It's very rare that you're just out in the middle of nature. And if you're out in nature, there are probably signs and paths and uh, maps. And most of our time is spent indoors, especially as we become older as adults. We're spending our time indoors in artificial environments. Cities are artificial environments. We intellectuals tend to spend more time in cities than do farmers. 
And so there's the sense in which technology is an environment or an atmosphere. And architecturally speaking, there has often been too much focus on the facade of a building. And analogically, you could say there's been too much focus on either the facade or the efficiency of technologies, uh, what they do. But technology is also a space we inhabit. And uh, we all inhabit a totally different space, not only from our parents, but even perhaps from our earlier selves. The frightening amount of time I spend online now, I would probably be happy just to sit here in my kitchen for a month and say, oh, I haven't been outside for a month. I never thought of that. I just I need to go out and walk because I'm talking to all my friends and colleagues around the world here on the Internet. I'm learning everything I can online. I've got an increasing number of Kindle books now, so I don't even have to pick up a paper book. There's this atmosphere in which I live that does not resemble the atmosphere I lived in when I was in my early 20s, in which there wasn't an Internet, in which you had to go out of the house to buy a newspaper or turn on the radio to see what's happening in the world. And you might not find out about certain things until the next day. Um, so I mean, the, the almost constant music that's playing in the background of our lives now, the constant machine like hums, the uh, the air conditioning we live inside. Slaughter Dyke uh, has talked a lot about that. And actually, I, I haven't mentioned Slaughter Dyke today, but in one sense, my idea about Slaughter Dykes is the same as anyone else, which is that there are all these fascinating ideas that are kind of scattershot and not systematized that well. But on the other hand, he does have this general vision that I think is very powerful, this idea of spheres as being self-enclosed, cut off, and viewing the mother-child sphere as the first version of reality, which is true. We could talk here about Melanie Klein as well, the relation with the mother as being our first experience of reality. The mother's body is the source of everything for the ba the infant. Um, so in a way, the, the mother is the first atmosphere, the, the first medium. Not only that we live inside the mother, but the, even after we're born, we're still living inside the mother in a way. And then Slaughter Dyke has a very nice way of relating that to later developments, uh, social spheres. And so there's a possible link there between uh, uh, technology and psychoanalysis, if you consider yeah. psychoanalysis in Melanie Klein's sense of, of the mother as medium and as objects is somehow breaking off from that primary medium, objects being partial objects broken off from the mother's body. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so, sorry to interrupt again, but it's uh, sure. uh, it's it's interesting indeed. Like technology as uteromimesis, I think Sloterdijk uh, talks about, and he's also a philosopher who talks about uh, uh, air and breathing uh, in relation to the pneuma and Nietzsche's stuff about this as well. So it's an uh, exception to uh, what you were saying uh, uh, to the list of people you were saying before, I think. Um, but I interrupted because I basically wanted to get to the last question and also give sure. uh, a little bit of space to uh, uh, Larissa Bolte to, um, yeah, please, Larissa. Um, could you, uh, yeah, just give us your question or it's, I think more of a request uh, and then we'll wrap things up uh, after this. Sure, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, you. you mentioned something in passing uh, that piqued my interest, which was about Simon Don and how he thinks that um, capitalism can't really be analyzed in the abstract and that rather you have to look at uh, how technology basically mediates capitalism and capitalist realities. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you can elaborate and how you would perform such an analysis, but looking at the time, maybe you could just tell me where I would find that in Simon Don so I can read it myself. <laughs> sure. Um, it's in the um, mode of existence of technical objects. I'm not sure I can find the page number right now. It's in the second section where he talks about human relation to technical objects, which is you know, one of the things about Simon Don's book is that it's so strange. There's so many weird ideas connected to each other. For example, the different relations of children and adults to technology. Who would have thought of that as a major topic? But um, one of the things he talks about, there's a Latourian background to this, of course. Latour is also uh, skeptical of the idea of capitalism, and he he's fed in that idea by Brodel. That Brodel, in his history of capitalism, wants to look at the emergence of capitalism through local and then regional networks. And Del Manuel Delanda also goes that direction by wanting to view, to see the problem not as capitalism, but the problem as being monopolies, international monopolies. Did the capitalism of small business and even national business not being a problem? Now Zizek will come by and say that's fundamentally fascist, right? He will say that if you say that, then you're saying capitalism was fine until the international Jews started exploiting it or something like that. So that's the possible danger with what Brodel is saying. 
But uh, what Simondon says, first of all, he has a nice discussion of alienation. He says that every era has its own form of alienation, and it's not always machines. Uh, in, in the Renaissance, the alienation was that of church dogma, and so their form of humanism was an anti-alienation discourse. Uh, in the age of industrialization, it was something else. It was romanticism, I guess. Humanism is romanticism. I'm thinking that in our time, it might be alienation by history. Um, one, one thing that I think alienates us is that we feel so immersed in the currents of history, the idea that we live in a specific time and we're conditioned by that time and we're going to die and another time's going to appear. And so in a way, we today have a humanism of classics, right? People want to look at classic works in different fields that they might think of as, as beyond time. I tend to think of them instead as like punctures in specific spatial temporal contexts. So it's always fascinating when you, when you can go back and read um, Tacitus or some other Roman historian. And they're not only outside of our time, they're outside of, of the general Roman time as well. Tacitus was not a typical Roman any more than he's a typical 21st century American. And so in a way, history has become a burden for us. It makes, in a way, it makes all of our lives too contextual. It takes away our ability to make contact with something that's outside of our current temporal context. And I think that's why Badiou's theory of truth uh, is, is captivating to so many people. But to get back to the specifics of your question, he, Simonon's main idea is that he's against finalities. He's against the idea that contexts swallow up the elements in the contexts. And so he doesn't like the idea that something called capitalism subordinates all of the individual technical objects to it. Technical objects persist through many different historical systems. So the book existed before capitalism, right? The book exists in capitalism, and the book in some form will exist after capitalism if we reach that point. And in a certain sense, capitalism is shaped by the book, just as Timothy Mitchell argues that capitalism is shaped by oil. You can't just say, oh, Saudi Arabia is capitalist. Well, yes, but the capitalism of Saudi Arabia is shaped by the specific properties of oil, which needs pipelines, and pipelines have to be defended in ways that cotton fields do not. And so oil will organize society in a way that cotton will not, even if they're both or spice, even if they're all tools of capitalism and major commodities of capitalism. Um, spice, for instance, in the Dutch experience, one of the interesting things about spice is that nutmeg and mace only grew on a couple of islands. And so it wasn't that hard for the Dutch East India Company to control them. All they had to do was guard those islands and then cut down whatever small number of trees of those plants existed on other islands and make sure no one else was able to export those plants. And so spice was much easier to control at first than many commodities are. And oil only exists in certain places and oil requires pipelines. And so I don't know if this is a direct enough answer to your question, but what he wants to say in a sense is that capitalism is subordinate to the commodities rather than the reverse. The specific character of commodities uh, will be surprising to capitalism. And you know, the era of, you know, Jameson talks about how we're in late capitalism because we're circulating cultural capital instead of physical capital. I think what Simondon would say if he were still alive is that um, the features of cultural capital actually change capitalism. It's not capitalism that defines them. And so capitalism shifts. And capitalism, we can't think of it as omnipotent. It's not going to be around forever. And Latour likes to argue that it doesn't dominate the whole world as it is. It's the, the, Latour would say the networks of capital are rather fragile as it is that um, all you have to do is walk a few feet and your internet connection doesn't work anymore. And so you can't use your American Express card. Or all that has to happen is that um, a hurricane hits uh, some place and then suddenly you can't communicate or all the flights are canceled. And Latour, Latour's response to 9-11, September 11th attacks, yesterday was the anniversary, was very different. Um, on the left, a lot of the reactions to 9-11 were, you know, of course the terrorists attacked America, the homeland of capitalism. You know, it's bad that the people died in the buildings, but capitalism deserved it. That was a typical attitude on, on some parts of the left. I remember a friend of mine saying, oh, she's so sorry the people were killed, but she loves that the World Trade Center was destroyed because of what world trade represents, globalization and so forth. Whereas Latour's take on 9-11 was that, look, the, thing, the country we call the superpower is actually very fragile. The superpower actually had horrible airport security. You know, Boston Airport was known for its horrible security well in advance of 9-11, and that's why the terrorists chose Boston, I believe. 
Um, and so what you call the superpower actually isn't so super. And NATO, which looked like it was dominated by the superpower, actually had to come to the defense of the superpower. Article 5 of NATO was brought in to defend, not Luxembourg, it was brought in to defend the United States for the first time. So isn't that ironic? And so Latour always says that we, we overestimate the strength of the strong. And he thinks that Marx and Engels are overestimating the strength of capitalism uh, when they talk about it like that. And so I think he likes the idea. Latour, of course, always wants to focus on individual actors rather than on society with a capital S or capitalism with a capital C or science with a capital S. He always wants to look at local networks. And that is, of course, the source of why he's criticized by many on the left. Many on the left will say that Latour is unable to change the network as a whole. He's only able to focus on local changes in networks. But what if the entire network is bad? Why can't we have a revolution? Well, it is true, I'd say, that Latour's way of thinking is prejudiced against the idea of revolution. He doesn't mind that because he sees revolution as a modern idea. This idea that you uh, simply form a plan and then get rid of all the traditional accretions of history and replace them with a plan. Okay, uh, there might be a downside to that, but architecture came to see the problem with that in the 1960s when housing projects were being blown up 15 years after they were being built because they turned out not to be good places to live. It turns out people like historical forms in their buildings. It turns out people like not living in high rises, but living close to, the soup, close to their grocery stores and close to their doctor. And so maybe Brasilia wasn't such a great idea for building a city because people don't want to have to drive to the medical neighborhood to go to the doctor. They want to have doctors in there and so on. So if we remember that Latour is always a critic of modernism, Simondon maybe not so much, but there's a bit of a critique of modernism there too, insofar as technologies for him are self-contained and local. Um, there's not really a capitalism for Simondon. He, he, he also seems more sympathetic to religion as Latour is than Marx and Engels. I don't know much about Simondon's life. I don't know if Simondon was a Catholic or something else, but I wouldn't be shocked if he were, based on how he talks about religion as being the peer of technology, as one of the two primal phases of existence. Um, so I don't know if, if that drifted too far away from your original question, but the idea is basically that specific technologies are more powerful than capitalism conceived as an abstraction. And that alienation will always be with us it's not the fault of capitalism, and we intermittently have to rise up against alienation, just like slow food rose up against fast food, and just like at some point there's going to be, maybe this is already happening, an anti-online lifestyle. You've got people buying cell phones that are simply made for making phone calls that aren't smartphones. Those are becoming more popular. Or, I don't know, are any of you involved in going offline for a week at a time? not answering an email. I, I'm afraid I haven't done that yet. I'm still very much a creature of the net. And it's probably not good for me sure. for all the reasons people have written about. But um, so maybe so, um, but maybe uh, maybe not everything that is solid melts into thin air then, uh, according to this uh, interpretation. Um, yeah, I, right. uh, I had to cut you off there because we're already um, uh, over time. Um, so I wanted to take a minute to uh, thank you very much, Graham, for being here with us today and for your talk, which I thought was very interesting and sparked uh, quite a lot of discussion, I, which I think could also have gone on for a, a little bit, but I'm afraid that this is uh, uh, all we have time for. So thank you again for uh, your talk and being here and thanks to everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, yeah, we do this weird digital quasi clapping. Um, okay. And um, yeah, uh, we'll uh, hope to continue the series in a, in a couple of months. I will just send all the info information uh, via the mailing lists if you could you could send me a link when it, this goes up on youtube so i can advertise Absolutely. it yeah this sure organized thank you all right uh thanks everyone and i hope to see you soon all right bye bye